Well, <clears throat> we were going to shoot an outside video for this lab that we've got to do. But it's coming to storm. So it looks like we're going to be together uh, inside instead, but at least in a slightly different fashion as we would have been otherwise in a dark room. So with that in mind, let's talk about your first lab. There it is, folks. That's the lab manual that you really need to put your hands on to do well in this class. Um, everything that's going to be in your lab test is straight out of this manual. Now, will I go through and explain it all to you and kind of outline what I want? Of course. Uh, will I be giving you quizzes throughout this lab that help you kind of be guided towards what I want you to know when it comes to exam time? Of course. By the way, if you see flashes or hear a boom, that's thunder and lightning. We're having quite the storm. Now, where was I at? <laughs> anyway, um, and will I have study guides available to you that will help you see what you should know and when? Of course. So it's all going to be there, but you know, with, with that in mind, let's go through and talk about the scientific method and uh, the rest of this first lab and see kind of where it takes us. All right, so the whole first part of this, it's all scientific method. Okay, it's all scientific method. Uh, and they do it in a weird way that I don't prefer necessarily, but uh, we'll just go with the flow and hope for the best. Now, the scientific method, according to this text, is an observation followed by a question, a then hypotho Ooh, dyslexia. hypothesis, uh, a prediction, and then an experiment. We're missing some steps, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, so an observation that your, your book uses as, as an example is uh, that you go and you get in your car, you put the key in the ignition, you turn that key and it goes click, click, nothing happens. Now, if I were to ask you what the problem is there, I bet most of you could probably tell me it's a battery problem. Okay, you probably got a dead battery. But you don't know for sure. So let's do this scientific method, wise, and go through and see if we can make this clear. Okay, observation. Put my key in the ignition. Turn it, click, click, nothing happens. Question, why won't this car start? Hypothesis, I bet it has a dead battery. Uh, a prediction, if I put a new battery in, it will then start. Okay, if-then statements are very important for this. Uh, they love these things, man, if-then statements. Again, we said it again. If I change the battery, then my car will start. Okay? And then an experiment. I go and I get a battery from AutoZone, my preference, and uh, drop it in, turn the key, cranks right up, runs like a million dollars. We are in good shape. Now, that, that is a nice, simple way of looking at the scientific method. There's nice dogs outside, too. Anyway. Then, what you'd have to do is have the results and conclusions and all that fun stuff, and you'd have your write-up and your peer review like we did in lecture, uh, but that's neither here nor there. What they do really emphasize here is the concept of a variable, a control, and a control group. And this is very important for us, okay? A variable, a control, and a control group. Um, I think in my introductory lecture, I talked about being involved. Actually, you know what? Let's change that. Let's talk about fish. So, <clears throat> in the past, I was involved in a research project where we were uh, exposing fish to a unique hormonal stimulant. Uh, the basic idea here is that the water around us, like all the hormone that we have in our systems and in our farms and all that's just everywhere, all this hormone. Um, it, it makes its way into waterways, and once it gets into the water, it plays all sorts of hell with amphibian and uh, fish life, you name it, okay? Anything that's in that water, it, th weird things happen as a result of high hormonal load, okay? And what we were doing in this particular case is working with a type of fish called Xiphophorus heleri. It's a cool scientific name. Uh, they're called the green sword tails. And basically, by exposing these fish to a tiny dose of a very specific androgen, okay, that's a male sex hormone, uh, we were able to take females and turn them male, in essence. 
Uh, they would begin to act like males. They display male characteristics. Uh, they would cease any attempt at reproductive activities. Uh, you can see the internal ovary basically just degrade to nothing. It was crazy. A single exposure, boom, changed uh, females to males. It was the craziest thing you've ever seen. And uh, if you've ever watched Jurassic Park, you kind of get where this is going. Uh, so let's do variable control and control group. So what we're doing is, actually let's just run through the entire scientific method, shall we? Uh, observation. In nature, it seems like hormones may be causing some strange things with uh, fish life in local streams, especially around cities. Uh, question. Is it possible to completely screw up uh, the, the sexual ratios for a species through hormonal influences? And if you're not aware, uh, sex ratios are super important. If you've got a whole bunch of males and very few females, your population is going to die fast because they just can't reproduce fast enough to, to keep up. Uh, and there is actually a lot of evidence out there that supports that um, the sex of offspring of even humans is not random. We would like to think it's pretty freaking random because our sex ratio as humans is nearly 50-50. There's actually a few more males born than females, but nearly 50-50. Um, the assumption there in being that males tend not to live to maturity, so there has to be more of them. To, anyway, moving on. Uh, and but but we have seen like after major wars or big catastrophes, if a lot of, uh, for instance, during wars when males die predominantly, um, like World War One, World War Two, what we saw after the war ended was a huge boom in female birth ratios. So we, moving moving back to it, let me try not to get off task here. My hypothesis is that. We are going to be capable of, with very small doses of androgens, augmenting the sex ratio in a population. Okay, population is a group of individuals of the same species. Okay, and uh, so we set up a uh, experiment. We set up an experiment, or have a first, I guess, is a prediction. If we expose these fish to this hormone, then they will change in sex ratio. We'll see more males. Experiment. We took some fish, we put them in a tank, we took a tiny amount of this hormone and put it in the water and let the water cycle without a filter for 24 hours. Uh, when we came back and checked our results, geez, after a week, it was crazy. We had one uh, female, she's, she grew all the male secondary sexual characteristics. If you want to go and look up green sword tails, they're pretty neat. Uh, but she would cruise at the top of the water with her fin out like a shark. It's wild. Uh, totally what you might call steroid rage or roid rage. Uh, she was, she had lost her mind. So we had, we had done this and it worked. Let's talk about variables, controls, and control groups now that you're familiar with the study. Our variable in this is the hormone. Do the fish see the hormone or not? That's the variable because it is in fact varying something. It changes. Do they get the hormone or do they not get the hormone? We want to see if things change with these fish after we add it. Now, controls and control groups. It's always good to have a lot of control on your experiments. Big lightning flash. Let's listen for the boom. Um, controls and control groups. So what we would do is we'd have uh, eight tanks of fish set up. 25 fish per tank. Eight tanks. Uh, four tanks do not get the experimental variable. Four tanks do get the experimental variable. We know how many males and females are in these tanks. There it is. Thunder. All right, anyway, we know how many males and females are in this tank, or in these tanks, I should say. These tanks uh, see no other augmentation, so we hit four of them with the hormone, and then look to see if anything changes with the sex ratios, or the way that the fish act, or anything along those lines. We look for changes. We have control because we have a tank set that doesn't see any kind of variable. That is a control group and a tank set that does see the experimental variable. That is called the experimental group. A control group and an experimental group. Four tanks in the control group, four tanks in the experimental group. A hundred fish in the control group, a hundred fish in the experimental group. The idea is we only change the variable. Nothing else is augmented. That way we can be sure that the changes that we then record, uh, record are due to the experimental variable and nothing else. Okay? And that's how control works. Yeah.
there is qualitative and there is quantitative data and this is exactly the way it sounds qualitative data is talking about the qualities of something how red are the tomatoes okay um, how did did the uh, organism grow uh, a tail augmentation um, you know what color is the carapace of the organism that is qualitative data Quantitative, quantity, quantitative, quantitative data, data is numerical. You measure the carapace. How long is it? Okay. Uh, you, you weigh the tomato. That's a numerical measurement. Uh, the way that your book describes this is you could say that a person has a, a shirt with red and white stripes. Red and white is qualitative. You could say that the shirt has 12 stripes. That would be quantitative. Okay. So qualitative and quantitative data are incredibly important. Yeah, man. And then that takes us on to the metric system. I think I need a marker. Okay, so let me ask you a question. I have here in my kitchen 25 ounces of olive oil. How, how many gallons, how many, how many of those would it take to make a gallon of olive oil? don't know. I do not know how many it would take. Uh, I have for you 52 ounces of juice. Well, not quite that much. How, how many of those? How many of those would it take to make a gallon? Uh, here we have a half gallon of milk. And um, how many pints are there in a half gallon? These are dumb measurements. Man, really painfully dumb, dumb measurements. There, there's no real reason to use them. It's awful when you have something like the metric system. Welcome to my daughter's writing pad. So uh, let me prove to you the, the merits of the metric system. Let's say we've got us a, a 2 liter. That looks like a 21. A 2 liter uh, Dr. Pepper. Okay, a two liter Dr. Pepper. And I were to ask you, oh, two liters, huh? Well, how many milliliters would that be? Well, I can quite quickly tell you that two liters is equal to two, one, two, three, two thousand milliliters. Two liters is two thousand milliliters. It's very easy to do this, okay? I can do it very quickly. You could say, um, uh, let's see. 20, 20 centimeters, 20 centimeters. That's a measure of length. So, okay, 20 centimeters. How many meters is that? How much of that would be meters? You could say, well, that's just 0.2 meters. Now, how am I doing these conversions so quickly? Uh, well, the answer here is very simple. Let me show you. What we do is we have the metric system set up in a fashion where it starts with, for our purposes, we're going to say K for kilo, H for hecta, or hecto actually, D for deca, and then there's a base unit. I like to put a big B for my base unit. And then we're going to go to D for deci, C for centi, and M for milli. Now, <clears throat> what on earth is old crazy Mr. Hopper getting at here? This base unit is any, any unit of measure. This could be uh, an L for liters. This could be a K for kilometers. This could be a G for grams. Liters being a volume measure. That's a volume measure. Uh, kilometers being a length and if you can't guess, G for grams, that is a weight. That is a weight measure. Okay. So let's go through and run some, some numbers here. Let's say we've got 33 uh, kilograms. 33 kilograms. 
That is a measure of weight. Oh, oh, hang on. That's 33 kilograms. Yep, our light's going to make this hard, but that's okay. 33 kilograms. And I want to know how many grams would that be? So grams would be our base unit. How many grams is 33 kilograms? Well, what I'd do is i put me a little dot here at the end. That way I know it's 33. I say, okay, that's going to be 33 kilograms to hectograms. Put a zero. To decigrams, we'll put a zero. To grams, put a zero. And our dot moves to there. So that would be 33,000 grams. 33 kilograms is one, two, three. 33,000 grams. Let me put a unit of measure so I don't forget that as I go. Um, so I would say 33 kilograms is 330 hectograms is uh, 3,300 decigrams or decagrams, which would be 33,000 grams. I just move my decimal place. And I could keep moving it. I could say, how many uh, milligrams would that be? And I just know, zero, zero, zero. All right? That'd be 33 million, I guess you might say. That is how this goes, folks. The metric system allows us to run these very simply and very quickly. Let's say that we've got three meters. Three meters. Okay, that's a unit of length. I want to know how many centimeters is in three meters, and I want to know how many uh, millimeters, yeah, millimeters, is in three meters. I guess I should put another M here. That's millimeters. Um, so, how do we do it? I've got three. Let's go ahead and take my unit of measure off, put my dot there. That's three meters, 30 decimeters, 300 centimeters. 3,000 millimeters. I know that there are 3,000 millimeters in a meter. I know, or I'm sorry, let me try that again. There are 3,000 millimeters in three meters. There are 300 centimeters in three meters. It is really quite straightforward, folks. You can work this one way or another way or what have you very easily to pull these numbers. And that's what makes the metric system so easy. Okay? That's what makes this so straightforward. If I want to uh, figure out how many liters I'm going to need, or no, no, let's do a unit of measure, how many, how many grams I'm going to need to have a certain amount of weight, okay, in kilograms, I can do that with great ease. If I want to know how many um, meters I need to go to get to a certain number of kilometers, like, this is very easy to quickly compute by using the metric system. It's way more simplistic than is an imperial system like what we use. Like, man, how many miles is in a, f or how many feet are in a mile? Like, these are gonna be crazy numbers. So, uh, things that we have to consider. I am gonna be putting together a little worksheet that you've gotta do on the metric system, just to prove you kinda know what you're doing. Now, try to work this out by hand, okay? Try to work it out by hand, be cool, okay? Try to work it out by hand, but I'm gonna be real with you. We're gonna be honest here. Uh, the reality is that you will never, ever, ever have to work these out by hand in the real world because you've got a phone sitting beside you, potentially that you're looking at right now, that will compute these just like that. Okay, and I'm a realist. I understand that's the way life is. But please try to do the worksheet by hand uh, just so you can better learn how it all fits together. All right, next part. Oh man, where are we at? We are in the biology lab, folks, and there you all are. Oh my gosh. Now, let me show you what I got here for you first. Here <clears throat> is yet another example of why the metric system is better than imperial. Let's get some focus. Let's get some focus. Okay, theoretically, this is in inches, 40, actually it's 39 and a half or so, something like that. Let's call that a meter. No, no, no. <clears throat> Let's call that a yard. We're going to pretend as a yard, all right? Let's call that a yard. Well, if you flip it over, now, folks, now it goes from one, uh, 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 focus, 
one to a hundred. Do you see? One to a hundred. Because one meter, one meter is the same as, you see it? Where is it? There it is. One centimeter to 100 centimeters. Oh my gosh. One meter is 100 centimeters. It's a miracle. And alternatively, if you get in here and you look, you can see the millimeters, right? 10 millimeters. Oh, focus. 10 millimeters per centimeter. So that's one centimeter, but that's 10 millimeters. That's two centimeters, but that's 20 millimeters. Here is... 50 centimeters, that is 500 millimeters, and here is one meter, and ladies and gentlemen, that's a thousand millimeters. The metric system is so much more simplistic and easy to use, and because of this, that's why we use the Dern metric system for all things scientifically oriented, okay? It's standardized. Everywhere else you go on the planet, for the most part, it's always going to be metric system because the metric system is how we standardize science. That's just how it works. Now, let's talk about some tools, shall we? What we have here, these are little baby graduated cylinders. Okay, they are graduated cylinders. It is a cylinder and it is graduated to a height. This is what we would use to measure smaller quantities of fluid, smaller quantities of fluid. Uh, a big Erlenmeyer flask like this. Like you can see this one here, uh, theoretically, says 250 milliliters, uh, but it actually doesn't measure 250. The highest value that you can see, this is a bad example. Let's pull off the tape. The highest value on here is actually, 200 milliliters. Do you see it? So I put this on your test and I say, what is that tool, man? You say, oh, that's an Erlenmeyer flask. And I say, how much volume of liquid can it measure? The answer is 200 milliliters. All right. Look at this. That's taller. That's taller than the flask is. But look how much liquid it can measure. Can you see? It's hard to see. That is 10 milliliters. This whole, this whole thing that is not broken, luckily, can only measure 10 milliliters. That's like just the very bottom of this thing, okay? So this measuring larger volumes, this measuring smaller volumes, and here we have a beaker, okay? Our beaker here, if you look at it, let me see if I can get the zoom right. Our beaker here, can measure a max of, what do you call that? 30 to 35, 40, 45 milliliters. Looks like it'll measure about 45 milliliters. But if you look at the side, it says 50. That's, that's a lie, okay? Uh, the reality is this will measure 45, it looks like 45, 45 milliliters. All right, so I put this on your test. I say, what is it? You say, that's a beaker. I say, what's the volume of liquid it can measure in total? You'll say it'll measure 45 milliliters. And uh, let's just wander around and see what else we can find. So, <clears throat> Got some little test tubes, got some bigger test tubes. You know, when you're running experimentation, this is the stuff you use, folks. Uh, um, what else do we have here? We got some thermometers. These are nice ones, too, man. Good thermometers. Got some pipettes, some nice pipettes over here. These are the simple kind. Uh, they are dis what are considered disposable pipettes. There are also fancier pipettes around this place somewhere. Uh, probably up in those kits right there that we're not, that we are not going to get into. Uh, what else do we have? What else do we have? So, here are some big old honking Erlenmeyer flasks. Alright, that is a big Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, you'd consider that a boiling flask. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else do we have? There's some larger... Um, graduated cylinders and some other graduated cylinders and some other graduated cylinders. Here's a variety of beakers. Okay, so all of this stuff you need to be able to identify and tell me the volume of liquid that you could measure with it. And you can see, again, quite clearly, that's, uh, oh, hang on. 
We're having focus issues. You would think that this camera would autofocus, but you'd be mistaken. That's uh, 250, um, 275, 300. So I guess that's 325 milliliters is the max it can hold, but it says 400. You tell me how you can measure 400 milliliters out of that. <laughs> anyway, all right. <clears throat> so that's how these things work, man. That's how these things work. Now, one more thing we got to do is we've got to show you how to accurately measure liquid with a graduated cylinder. Because that's what they're for. They're for measuring volume. All right, check it out. I have placed an arbitrary amount of fluid into this graduated cylinder. I did not want to put any food coloring or anything in it, but you can see there's an arbitrary amount of liquid in there. Okay. Now what I want you to notice first is that there are two sets of numbers on this cylinder. And these start at 100 over here, okay, and they go down as the volume of liquid goes down. So that'd be 70 milliliters, 80, 90, 100 milliliters. Then over here, they start at zero and they go the opposing direction. The idea is if I've got 50 milliliters and I wanna pour 10 out, I can make sure by using this, just the volume I'm using without any subtraction. So we wanna know how much is in there, so we're gonna use this side. Now, <clears throat> I know it's hard to see, and I'm sorry for that. It's hard to see. Let's see if I can do anything for you here. It's hard to see, but the reality of this is that, as we march over to the board, this graduated cylinder, if you were to look at the water itself inside of the cylinder, it would look like that. Okay, it would look like that. I know you can't see it here, but I swear to you, it looks like that. And the reason, the reason for this is very simple. Uh, water is both cohesive and adhesive. Because water is both cohesive and adhesive, what that means is uh, that the water molecules are cohesive. They, they stick to themselves, okay? They stick to each other. Uh, so again, you get the water on the end of your finger, you know, it's gonna stick there. Uh, and the uh, water molecules are adhesive. That means that they're going to stick to the glass. So they're cohesive. They stick to each other. The water molecules stick to each other. And they are adhesive. They stick to the glass of our graduated cylinder. Okay? And the gist of it is that the water molecules are going to try to climb against gravity the walls of this cylinder. They're going to try to climb up the walls. And uh, the water molecule molecules stick to each other, so you end up with a dip in the center and a high spot on the side. So we call this the meniscus, okay? It's referred to as being a meniscus. Now, how do you measure the volume? This could be 70, oh, can't read it, 70, okay? And this could be 60. So how do you know the volume is actually in there? What you do is you measure from the bottom of the meniscus. The bottom of the meniscus. Okay. And that would probably be what, you know, 68, 67, something like that. So you could say that there were 67 milliliters of fluid in there. Now, as I look at this, you can see that it is just above the 80 milliliter line. As I look at it, I would say it's got about 81 or 82 milliliters of fluid within it. The idea is, however, you need to realize that you are reading the meniscus when it comes to a graduated cylinder. This is a special, special thing. When it comes to reading volumes of fluid, you're reading the meniscus. On your test, on your lab exam, you can guarantee I'll be asking you about this. All right, let's continue. All right, folks, there's something else that we need to talk about here. <clears throat> and that is the capacity for doing Celsius to Fahrenheit conversions. All right. In your lab manual, we have this, that Fahrenheit and Celsius are measures of temperature. And they are just two of several measures of temperature. And if you look 
at a thermometer here in lab, you can see there's an F on that side and the numbers that correspond to it. And you can see on the opposing side a C. C for Celsius, F for Fahrenheit. Now, what you need to understand is that in science we use Celsius, period, the end. Okay? Uh, zero is where water freezes. 100 is where water boils. It's like the metric system, man. Like we know where things are based off of these units of measure. We don't use Fahrenheit because the numbers are just crazy. Okay? Celsius is the universal standard for measuring temperature in a scientific setting. So you will always report to me your measurements in Celsius degrees. Okay? Celsius degrees is where it's at. That's all that really matters for us. So, um, yeah. Let's look at this. What we've got here are some formulae, all right, to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Wait, no, no, no. This is to convert to Fahrenheit, and this is to convert to Celsius. So Fahrenheit is equal to 1.8 times degrees Celsius plus 32, whereas Celsius is equal to, parenthesis, Fahrenheit minus 32 in parenthesis times 0.556 which is also five ninths. Really, you want to use five ninths. That way, you, don't, you get away from the repeating aspect of this. Uh, now, full disclosure: I am not going to ask you to do a Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion on your test using the formula. Or if I do, I'll give you the formula. Uh, you're not going to have to memorize it. In other words, um, what I really want you to understand is that most of the time, when you think about temperatures, you're thinking about Fahrenheit. Okay, you're thinking about Fahrenheit. Uh, the reality is that any time in science you're doing anything, man, you're going to be looking at the C side of that freaking thermometer. Okay? So Celsius is scientific. The metric system is scientific. Uh, we don't use the, the imperial measurements or Fahrenheit for our purposes here. All right, cool. All right, uh, you obviously will not be measuring any weights for me, uh, but... My goal here is not to get you a grade in my class. My goal is for you to better understand science. And if you go into some form of scientific field that uses a good scale, uh, it's possible that you would need to know how to use it so you don't look a fool uh, when you walk in the door. So I'm going to show you how to use one of these good, nice scales uh, as we sit here. I don't even have it plugged in yet, so let's do that now. I'm going to plug this in. Okay, there we go. Nothing's happening, so there's got to be an on button around here. Someplace, let's just try to hit yes and see what happens. Ha! All right, good. Okay, it's communicating. All right, good, we're at zero, but if I were to apply weight to this, It'll screw up sometimes, all right? Sometimes it'll get off. It'll say a weird number here. And what you have to do is you have to hit tear. Can you guys make that out? It says tear. Let's see if we can. Yeah, it's better focus. I'm going to hit tear. And what tear does is it zeroes everything out. Like, for instance, if the, if the scale got off by a little bit and I wanted to make sure that it was accurate, I could hit tear. And that zeroes it all back out. And if I take that away now, I get the exact opposite value. So let's tear it again. Uh, what I can do is I can measure all sorts of things with the scale, man. So I can give you uh, a beaker full of scissors that weighs 206 grams. Um, I can take that away. Let's re-tear the scale, make sure it's zeroed. Throw a penny on there and it's going to weigh 2.5 grams. Throw another penny on there and it weighs 5.6. The precision is outstanding. Throw another penny on there. It weighs 8.1. That's pretty fascinating. <laughs> Got some interesting values going here. That's more like it. Okay, fascinating. So it, anyway, all the same. What we've got here is um, methods of um, measuring things very precisely. And again, being able to zero that scale out and make sure it's accurate. Uh, sometimes what we have to do is uh, we have to have what's referred to as a weigh boat. Like if you're trying to measure the volume of a liquid, for example. So if I want to, or I'm sorry, that's incorrect. If I want to measure the weight of a fluid, I can't just pour my fluid on there. So what I do is I put my beaker on, I tear it to zero it out, and then I can pour fluid into this, and you can see it's at a negative here, 
and I can put it back on the scale and it'll give me the weight of the fluid. Okay, so that's how we use these scales. They're very, very handy, wonderful tools in a laboratory, and uh, that's how they work. Okay, again, I just want you to know like that's how this works. Uh, my goal is to prepare you for science in your future, not just to, you know, do stuff required for a grade. All right, cool.